If you are not starting uh, tests from the very beginning, you are writing untestable code and then you just cannot do anything about it. Hello everyone, this is the third episode of the Synthesized Mind the Data Gap podcast. And today we're going to discuss how to establish the proper quality gate how you can start writing tests, how you can start configuring winters, even in the early stage uh, project. So you're not spending all the resources. We know how it goes uh, usually with the early stage projects. You probably don't want to waste all of your resources uh, for doing uh, configuration and testing. That's what we want to discuss today, how to deal with this. And that's why here in this virtual studio, we have Denis Borovikov, who is the CTO of Synthesized. Welcome to the stream, Denis. And Ivan Panamaryov, who recently joined Synthesized as a staff uh, software engineer. And uh, he has got a lot of experience building uh, from scratch different projects, uh, including um, configuring quality gates and uh, test automation. So yeah, welcome to this broadcast, Why, Ivan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi. Hi, everyone. Okay, so to begin with, uh, why do you folks think that it's really important to discuss this topic? Uh, I mean, the quality gates and uh, establishing this uh, test automation process, how does it touch you? Like, why, why do, do you feel like you want to talk about it? <laughs> yeah, maybe I can start. Um, so I quite often I, I saw that developers are hoping that uh, even if they start with quite low quality, they can improve it in future. Um, so I, I would call it over optimism in, in, in many cases. Yes, you can do refactor, uh, do refactoring, of course, and like that's very important to like to know how to do refactoring because the code is never ideal. You you, sh you always yeah have to try to improve that. But there are some uh, pieces that better to get right in the beginning. Um, otherwise, it's gonna be expensive to change them later. Uh, and what is more important, it's quite cheap to start them using straight away. Things like uh, static code analysis or quality gates uh, and things like that. They, they are not hard to configure and start to use at all. So just more like sake of like laziness and, you know, not, not or better to say not being lazy and just configure them and start to use. And if you not configure them from the beginning, later, when you have thousands of lines of code, it's going to be a headache to, to, to try to pass all these quality gates. Yeah, Drew, at, at this point, then is someone we might argue with you like it's, that it's easy to configure everything. We know how it, how it happens. Like, you know, you, you add some tool like Sonar Cloud or some linter, for example, <laughs> for Kotlin, and you, <laughs> you get into this rabbit hole to configure in some way, you can write some code at least. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you mean um, uh, the tool tool might might be too restrictive, and uh, produce a lot of uh, like false positive positives uh, or false negatives depends how yeah, you see yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, the good news: uh, some tools have good defaults. Um, like from from my experience, Sonar Cloud has very liberal config by default. Uh, you most likely won't gonna have any problems to so just uh, enable it. Uh, and that's already like, kind of a very good start. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Ivan, what's what's your what's your experience with it? How do you feel about it? Is it kind of, do you feel it's really easy to establish or do you wanna, yeah, do you wanna comment on that? Well, well, I have to, first of all, I have to agree with Dennis. If you are not starting uh, tests from the very beginning, you are writing untestable code, and then you just cannot do anything about it. And then if you are not uh, using uh, linters from the very beginning, and at some point you <laughs> attach linter and you got lots of uh, lots of issues, you won't fix them. You you never you will never fix them. So it's very important to uh, start with all those quality gates uh, from the very beginning, from day zero. Uh, uh, but <clears throat> of course, uh, people will complain. <laughs> uh, people <laughs> will inevitably complain uh, uh, because uh, complain. it will <laughs> yeah. yeah slow down uh, 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 slow down their productivity, uh, slow down writing code. And uh, uh, your responsibility as a senior developer 
uh, is to configure all this stuff correctly is to if you are using check style for example you have to very carefully choose what you are going to to filter out uh, what you are going to accept uh, if you are talking about i don't know some um, requirements about tests then should not be very restrictive so that uh, developers can do their their work yeah 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 i actually agree with this at least with this point like if you haven't started from the beginning uh like writing code according to the linter then at some point of time you will see like a lot of warnings in the logs and you just yeah you will never just give up the real yeah. yeah yeah you will never mention the real issue which will come for for sure it will come and yeah it's like a big log with warnings and it's like huh. Yeah, like overall, the hardest and like most expensive parts, if you talk about testing specifically, it's always starting, like start mm -hmm. starting introducing testing to your project. When you already have infrastructure, it, it's relatively easy. Like developers like to complain that it's kind of very kind of hard and takes a lot of time to write tests. Uh, I kind of disagree. I think it's more like it's hard to start. Uh, there is like huge investment in beginning, especially if you didn't have tests before again, like better to start early. But when you have decent infrastructure, it's relatively easy to, to code tests. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's totally true. But you have to come to, to that point when you when you have all the infrastructure, all the linters configured and all the some 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 configurations at least written for yeah. test automation for different tests. And you, you need to come step by step i think to, to that uh, stage where you are comfortable writing more tests and yeah and after after that point it, it will actually speed up your te uh, your development yeah, yeah that's true usually why you need tests not because some manager wants to have uh, big coverage but because you mm -hmm. want to have uh, faster feedback and also you want to debug uh, kind of faster everything not just you know spinning all the environment in Docker, just on the local machine, you, you want to do something like much more uh, kind of uh, faster or smarter. Yes, yeah, as we yeah. can do this. Uh, on, on the other hand, I uh, also don't want to be preachy and uh, say to everybody that everybody should have like perfect uh, kind of test, uh, uh, test suite and uh, otherwise they should like leave the profession or something like that uh <laughs> situation like different um and i personally was a startup uh, member several times and i and i know what it is to be a part of a startup like imagine you have a i don't know like investor school you need to show prototype like next week uh and you need to finish some coding and, and you like working on quite high time pressure i would say of course, you will sacrifice some quality, and quite often you'll you'll um, kind of compromise on tests. Uh, so I, it's hard to ju judge people for you know not following uh, all development practices because yeah, there are different business conditions, especially in startup world. Um, but yeah, so what does it mean? Like if we don't have time, we 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 can kind of can just just relax and say, you know, we don't have time. We're not gonna write tests. Uh, I wouldn't say so. So even if you work under um, time pressure and you have very little res time resources, you can still start doing testing. And I, I guess this is the, like the first kind of part of our uh, conversation. Like z we would call it like zero zero level uh, of testing. Like how to start like testing if you don't really have much resources. If you really on rush. Um, mm -hmm. So. You you yeah, should be yeah. At this, yeah at this uh, stage you should be very uh, smart about ROI uh, about returns return on investment like what would give you like the biggest return given like very kind of small small investment this is like your initial strategy of course uh, there are like optimal strategies uh, we all know about test pyramid and how that should look like but now I want to focus about like quick wins like how how to get something with, without spending um significant time just you know spend some half an hour and get some some result um first of all i would recommend with some smoke and turn tests that, that that's like super helpful like just just having some gauge which which would tell you if, if your project alive or not uh, because like 
especially when you need to show something to investor again, back, back to Oster, mm -hmm. right? Whenever you make a change, you, you need to like quickly see if, if it's still, you know, alive. That's the first thing that which comes to my mind. The second, uh, we uh, already discussed that things like uh, linter static analysis and quality gates, they're really easy to implement. Uh, the, good, the good part here is that it's really easy to start. You you personally don't need to code any test. That's the beauty of static analysis that it comes kind of for free since it's configured. You just need to follow all kind of analyzer recommendations and, and that's all. It, it, it tests code for, for you. You don't need to write any tests. Mm -hmm. uh, then I would also focus on integration testing um, because again, it uh, answers on high level question like whether your code works uh, or not. Uh, of course, it's not gonna give you very good coverage but still like uh, high level answers at this stage, uh, I think are more, more important. So, so Dennis, uh, I'll interrupt you. So you want to have, for, for example, if we can define some several stages for those who are listening uh, to our podcast, what would we uh, recommend for kind of zero stage when you wanna have like, at least in the several days, build some, some setup, which will allow you to start to begin with uh, some, at least some, uh, quality gate at least with some testing. Is it is it correct? Like you you want to have some static analysis with some liters and something else, right? Yeah, some uh, some integration and end to end testing. Like depends on your language and depends on your technology. If it's Spring, uh, yeah, you you probably gonna have a, a Spring component test using Spring context. Um, if it's a UI uh, part of your code, it's gonna be Playwright. Um, yeah, so yeah, depending yeah, yeah. on play, play, playwright, Selenium, or whatever, like or yeah. Selenium, yeah. And, and at, at this point, I, I would know like you don't want to build a lot of end, end to end tests, I think at this point, you just want to cover yeah. some some cases, some smoke, uh, so do yeah. some smoke tests with you. So, yeah. uh, speaking of end to end tests, like in terms of ROI, they're quite poor, I would say, uh, they're hard to write, but at least having. Uh, smoke set of end-to-end -end test, uh, I find like very like helpful. It's it's a good balance. Like you have have very it's it's hard to write, but if you have very few, um, they, they uh, tend tend to be very helpful. Okay. Well, and, and I can argue about uh, uh, that it's hard to write end-to-end uh, -end tests, smoke tests. You can all. It's about only three or five uh, uh, lines of code. Actually, your login screen. You are just logging, and you just see something. You do something with your application and get result. Oh, or yeah, if uh, we are talking, <laughs> or if we are talking uh, APIs, you can check with retrofit some something like hello yeah, slash hello. That, that's a very good point. I think end-to-end -end tests become more tricky for bigger applications, like with a lot of components when it's slow. Yeah. And for very slow application, probably the only set you need is really end-to-end -end, uh, kind of test. Uh, if it's really that simple, if it's CRUD application, right? You just test that you like you enter some data and you you get it back. So you you test almost entirely. You don't have maybe other logic than this. Okay, mm -hmm. I think we forgot about some important things <laughs> at stage zero. Uh, well, uh, while talking about stage zero, we are talking about uh, uh, something that we should show next week uh, to yeah. our management. And still, still, we have to set up something. O okay, we mentioned uh, static analysis, we mentioned the end to end test, but uh, we forgot to mention maybe Docker Compose, Docker File, Docker Compose, because uh, it's yeah. a very good thing that you should do from, from the very beginning. Uh, it's uh, best documentation for your project. And uh, uh, folks that uh, deploy your will later deploy your application into cloud. They will say big thank you to to you. <laughs> and uh, if uh, you are going to give uh, the project to other developers, they will uh, get uh, um, many uh, important things from your Docker files and your Docker compose. Everything that uh, that's needed to start your application. Yeah, and then I, I would mention documentation, <laughs> however, like however files, simple, like that. yeah, yeah, yeah they, but, they, they, they think it is, but uh, you should never forget about README. And uh, moreover, uh, I think you should, uh, you should think about documentation as code from stage zero. You just uh, need to, to set up a separate folder with maybe it's a bunch of ASCII doctor mm -hmm. files, but uh, it will going to evolve with your project. 
So you you won't have to catch up later when your project evolved and you don't have any documentation at all. So yeah, good, this, uh, yeah and I think a uh, good part here is that again, uh, if you use uh, modern build system, you get it for free. You just need to configure that again, like no actual work, no actual coding. It's just, it's just configuration that needs to done. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And concerning um, documentation, it's great to have documentation together with your code. I think people should forget about you know wikis uh, or wh yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah. whatever else. You uh, it's you better it when you keep repo. your documentation. Yeah, Sa same repo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, here we are. And do you think it's it's feasible to do like all the stuff uh, with within like one uh, middle level engineer kind of? I I know that it's quite quite approximate, but this is something feasible uh, for for one uh, engineer, right? I think it's totally feasible from, from my experience. Yeah, like if you say uh, a backend engineer working on REST service, you can create Swagger test at least. Um, you can even have some unit tests for complex logic. It's totally mm -hmm. feasible even if you're under time pressure. Yeah, you, right. you have to, to have experience, of course. If you never did these things, of course, it will take some time. But uh, yeah. if you did these things be before, uh, it will take only a couple of days. All right, moving, yep. moving to the next level, like uh, we will call it like first level. Uh, what do you want to add? Uh, how how we want to improve our current stage? Well, so probably now you have some time, so you you can maybe plan your uh, testing activity and uh, you know make it part of your development process, and maybe th start thinking about like how testing should look like. What uh, your test par pyramid should look like and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, th I think Ivan had uh, great points uh, on this. Topic. Well, I, 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 yeah, I think that if at uh, point zero you uh, me, you omitted uh, uh, unit tests, it's uh, the best uh, the best time to introduce unit tests and write lots of unit tests here. So you you should uh, uh, you should select a tool for uh, for your tests. Uh, it depends, of course, on your language. If we are talking about uh, J J Java world, uh, I'd prefer uh, J Unit Five because it's most elaborate uh, uh, testing framework with G assertions. So th there are lots of uh, tools actually, and uh, based on your experience, you should select uh, the be best ones that uh, will help you to to do unit testing effectively. Uh, and uh, if you are not doing, uh, if you are not writing your code, uh, uh, sorry, if you are writing your code with unit tests, you will not be able to write untestable code. Uh, which you will not be able to to cover with tests later. So this is the most important things I, I think on stage two. Yeah. So probably it's like holy grail of testing. It's tests that uh, very fast. They can run very fast. They give feedback very quick. Uh, they shape your code. They they help you to design. So it's really things that make the difference. Uh, but perhaps needs some At investment. At this point, you will also uh, face uh, the problem uh, of uh, testing your external dependencies. Your program yeah. surely runs you, uh, some database. Uh, it may depend on Kafka, Redis, or whatever. So at this point, uh, you will need uh, to, to attach uh, some external dependencies to your, to your unit tests or component tests. Uh, you can call them differently. And uh, we also in Java we also have some fine uh, some fine tools for this like test containers, uh, but um, on the other hand, we you can also use mocks at some point. Uh, it's uh, cho chooses yours. <laughs> uh, uh, wh wh what to choose? Yeah, yeah. This the same thing. You probably can find uh, some tools for JavaScript, for Go, for Python development. We, yeah, we won't. Uh, cover all of these tools, you, you probably can find them. And uh, yeah, at the same time, I think it's, it's a good point to think about the like, coverage, how you measure how many tests you want to write, how many things are not covered yet, because yeah, probably you, you don't care much about like some numbers, but you care about which methods you just forget to uh, to cover, like and yeah. where, where, where something gonna crash, right? 
Yeah, absolutely agree. Uh, numbers uh, does not make any sense in uh, when we are measuring coverage. Maybe for some legacy pro project which was not uh, tested before, when you uh, attach a coverage report and you see, oh, you covered 10%, uh, 20%, it makes sense. Uh, but when we are talking about a Greenfield project, it doesn't make any sense at all. You, you might have 100% uh, coverage and uh, still have lots of bugs. And it's uh, uh, difficult to achieve a high uh, percentage of coverage. Uh, so I would think that the most important thing here is to have a clear coverage report that you can watch it at any time you want uh, to, to see uh, if you forgot to cover some branches of your code. Uh, when talking about Java, we have a wonderful thing called Jacoka, which uh, uh, calculates uh, coverage of branches, which part of if uh, uh, worked and which not worked. So <clears throat> uh, you should, I I if uncovered code is similar, if it's trivial, if it's just, uh, I don't know, write log or throw exception or do very simple stuff, why should you cover it? You can see with your own eyes that uh, this code is correct. <laughs> uh, what you should cover actually is complicated, complicated methods. And uh, if you explain this point to your programmers, they will complain less about uh, uh, the need to uh, cover their code with tests, actually. Yeah. To, to, to heat up our conversation a little bit, I want to throw something. Um, uh, uh, there is quite a um, fa famous uh, opinion from uh, David Heinemann Hansen, I, I think, uh, which said that he uh, kind of disappointed in unit tests and he prefers component tests. Instead, he, he says like in in uh, in in many cases they like not worse. They give you very good coverage, uh, and uh, they they uh, yeah tend to detect problems uh, more often. Uh, what do you think on this topic? Uh, maybe you've, you've seen this trend of uh, you know like uh, bashing on on the unit testing, saying like stop doing this, like stop writing mocks, just do component tests, like. I think the most uh, important problem here is terminology. What do we call uh, unit tests? What do we call component tests? What do we call integration tests? Because uh, uh, borders are very vague here. It's. Uh, yeah. I, I think yeah, we yeah. could uh, just just think of tests that don't uh, that don't need our program to run our actual program to run. They they are unit and component, and uh, tests that do need our work to run that end to end tests. While talking about unit and component tests, uh, there are tests that don't require anything. I mean, uh, no databases, uh, nothing, just, just mocks maybe. And uh, tests that actually require uh, databases running, databases, Kafka, Redis, uh, uh, all the modern stuff to run. And yeah. uh, uh, he, he, here are the ma main division. And you must understand that uh, if you are uh, moving up this uh, hierarchy of tests, you get uh, more and more restrictions. If you are running actual databases, uh, you are doing asynchronous tests. You are, uh, if, if you are running actual systems, they are uh, black boxes for you. You ask uh, your browser to render something and you are waiting uh, for it to happen. And if it doesn't happen, you just don't know if it's not going to happen at all or, or if you're just waiting, you should wait for, for a bit more. It, the same is for Kafka. If you are running real Kafka, real message broker, and you don't get any messages in your test, you never can tell if you are not get get them at all, or you should wait and get them. So this well, test yeah. will be inherently it, 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 flaky. It, 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 yeah, I think it's quite clear. I think uh, DHH opinion is uh, coming from web development circles, where like the only external system you have is database. And oh. you work with the database with uh, ORM, you know, and in like in tests, you would use uh, in memory database. So th those tests, like they're simple, they seem to be somewhat in between, between like unit and integration tests. They kind of formally, they're not unit tests, they test, you know, several units, but also they're quite lightweight. They work with stuff only in memory, they don't do any network communication. So they kind of in like very sweet spot. And a lot of people argue that you kind of need only them. If, if your system that ah. simple. Uh, but you actually can... your mock will, your in-memory database never works like real database. So yes. if you get some something from H2, 
uh, you don't have guarantees that it will work on Postgres. Uh, the, the same. Actually, we have, you have uh, guarantees that, you, that it won't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, <laughs> at least in my like it happened. <laughs> but so. actually, you you still have to do uh, to to choose both approaches. We have uh, say H two ah. database uh, in memory database where uh, which is lightning fast when you are talking about tests. It starts in no time and you can do many tests in it. If you are using say test containers to write uh, to to run a SQL Server, it will take you up to a couple of minutes just to start a SQL Server in container. So uh, programmers will not run those tests very often. And that's the problem. And uh, there are things that you actually cannot uh, test without mocks. If we are uh, testing Kafka in Kafka world, and if we are uh, testing, mm -hmm. say, uh, Kafka streams, we have uh, a great mock called uh, topology test driver there. And you can run it fast. You can do many things. But it still doesn't, of course, it doesn't guarantee that it will behave like real Kafka cluster. But there are things in real Kafka cluster that you just cannot test. The same with yeah. Redis. You have a, a tool called Redis Mock, and uh, it's it's kind of a re implementation of Redis in Java, which is of course it, it is is a buggy re implementation. Uh, yeah. But you still want to use it if you don't want to run Docker containers, start Redis, and uh, it's and moreover, it's not a black box for you anymore. You can do things with with your Redis with your Mock Redis with this tool. Which you cannot do with real Redis. Yeah, I, I agree. I also resonates with like with my experience very much. Uh, I used to be believer in this DHH idea, like the right component test with like database and memory, and you will be fine. Um, mm -hmm. But as long as you get something on top of that, your kind of your picture of world is ruined. Like you, you suddenly need to write mocks, and you don't know how, and like your like code is untested. You have Kafka or something. And you cannot really properly test that, uh, and 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 that kind of changes perspective. So, so what's the main takeaway? Maybe to to sum up, yeah. uh, I think you should uh, uh, thoroughly think about things that you are going to test using real, uh, uh, real things. Maybe you should build uh, some uh, some framework or some platform and test it thoroughly with your actual with test containers, and then using API of this platform. Uh, uh, which guarantee you the same work with mock and with the real thing. You can write lots of uh, unit tests using mocks that will test your business complex business logic. I think the idea is like this. All right. At, th at this stage, we just discussed like at the stage level one, or yeah, we started with zero level, so it's like level one. <laughs> you have to write more uh, tests, uh, unit tests, and component tests. And as well, in, in, introduce uh, you know, inject the uh, test coverage reports, which will allow you to to be more uh, and uh, to be sure that you're covering everything you want to. And uh, at this time, uh, I, I believe we we kind of can can um, write more documentation or more properly do that as soon as we started with some maybe general or basic stuff, but. As soon as we come with the more complex uh, logic, even with tests, we should mention that in, in, in the documentation and uh, take care more, more, much more pressure, precisely with how we write the documentation for some classes for APIs. And uh, do you think, guys, uh, for this, we will have to have like few people working on this, like as from the resources perspective, like two, three engineers, like mid level, could, could deal with this, right? Yeah, yeah of course. It depends on the experience, as usual. But <laughs> yeah, we are just approximately, you know. <laughs> yeah, like my my kind of uh, rule of thumb or like typical thinking about resourcing, like to really invest into infrastructure, you need at least two engineers. So one is still picking up like business tasks, and another can 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 do some tasks from from your mm -hmm. uh, kind of technical debt backlog. So two, like at at, uh, at least like better three. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And then we are moving to the next level, like second level, where you wanna improve more. And uh, what do you think, guys? What you wanna do here? 
well, uh, I guess the third level is already about like systematic approach uh, to, to your testing, like organization-wide, like you should start thinking about things like efficiency. So like you, you not just have tests, you also thinking how to run them efficiently on like high scale. Um, I, I guess you, you start thinking about scaling issues. Uh, at this yeah, point. yeah. As, as for example, for the end-to-end -end tests, like if you are using Selenium, you you start to think how to run them in parallel, like with some Selenoid or whatever uh, tool you will use for that. Or at least if you have, for example, playwright tests or some uh, tests which are checking uh, UI, uh, you wanna probably build some dynamically created uh, environments so you can run these tests against each branch before the merging to master branch uh, so these kind of things they, they require more time to configure for sure and require more time to uh, more precisely write this end-to-end -end test so they are not just you know taking several hours to, to run so you you split them case by case or uh, requirement mm -hmm. by requirement whatever it is so you you more carefully uh, write those uh, and uh, i remember uh, ivan you said that we need to start removing this test at the same time and writing mm -hmm. more on the low level, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. If uh, uh, we should uh, keep, uh, uh, we should uh, keep the set of end-to-end -end tests as small as possible, uh, because uh, uh, yeah, end-to-end -end tests are flaky, end-to-end -end uh, tests are expensive. And uh, uh, generally, uh, people will not run uh, your end-to-end -end test too often, uh, like they run uh, unit tests. So if they run yeah. unit tests often, they should be able to catch uh, to catch the bugs. So yeah, you should uh, keep them short. And at this point, yes, of course, we we have uh, many people. We have a mature mature code base, and uh, our all our pipeline is going to run longer, and. Uh, Developers should not wait for more than five to ten minutes to get uh, that uh, green checkbox or red cross, and uh, so at this point we should uh, think about how to achieve this. Maybe running not all the tests, maybe uh, running tests in parallel, uh, cutting uh, cutting end-to-end uh, -end tests, uh, writing more fast-running unit tests. Uh, all all of this. Yeah, you could have uh, all this sort of like text for tests, so you can run uh, tests selectively. So you could have like like fast, uh, like slow mm -hmm. vision, slow test. Say like you can start grouping tests into ca categories. Um, yeah, this kind of things I, I guess help. Um, but by the way, what about uh, like manual testing? We kind of skip this topic entirely. Uh, like oh. at the peak of uh, kind of our test. Environment, it was like manual testing. Uh, so <laughs> testing. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I would say so. Like, who, who are doing manual testing? <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I'm like, I think, I don't know. Uh, actually, if you thinking about manual testing as a separate uh, engineer doing this job, that's probably not the case, in, in my opinion. But if you're thinking about manual uh, testing as a role, which you can play, I, I know, at least a few hours a day wh while you're developing something, that probably makes sense to me. And I I don't think it's, it, it's like something which we should uh, somehow mention in our strategy, how we uh, do all the things. It, it's something, it's like common sense. You write the code, you run the environment, you write, yeah. you run, you, you click buttons or you, uh, call your API in Postman or whatever. This is something like you're doing manually while you while you're developing, and I'm not quite sure if you need to do this repeatedly, stage by stage. As soon as you're writing as well some uh, test automation, doing some test automation, and using some bullet gates, which we discussed. So as as for me, it's it's kind of uh, I don't know, not practical approach to have someone like person who are just, you know, uh, strictly looking uh, after you, like if you clicked everywhere or so. <laughs> yeah, so like speaking as like activity, like probably manual testing exists like in general, not as a profession, 
And if you look at all types of testing, uh, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there are two big groups. It's like regression testing and exploratory testing. If you're talking about regression testing, it's a subject for automation, I would say completely. So you typically mm -hmm. want to automate in your regression testing completely. Uh, automation of uh, exploratory testing is a tricky thing, but <laughs> on the other hand, uh, it's the work is so little uh, in terms of resources that it can be done by by uh, you know team members by product owners so perhaps you don't even need like dedicated person to do exploratory testing um just um, um you know anecdotally like asking uh, like people working in uh, modern kind of technological companies in most of cases they would say that testing is done by either developers or product owner or both mm -hmm. or or users on production or users on production. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, if but not an that. appointed po uh, person who just uh, blindly yeah. reads some script and repeats yeah, yeah. it uh, we, like we don't need it is, is, is in uh, kind of past seems um uh, yeah but still so as, as kind of as activity, we still kind of need it. Maybe very little. We don't have a dedicated person, but we need uh, some place and some kind of um, time <laughs> when when we do that, right? And for mm -hmm. that, uh, it would be nice to have environment. So yeah. imagine you as developer, you finished your task. You either you or you asking your colleague or you asking your product owner, but you need to deploy it somewhere. Um, interesting uh, kind of trend uh, nowadays it's uh, getting rid of static uh, test environments uh, because again mm -hmm. scaling issue like if you have a lot of teams um, they start fighting for this test environment and, and people start creating like this UAT1, UAT2 you know like different environments uh, like more modern technique nowadays is um, all these dynamic environments that created for each pull request um, that's very interesting. Uh, might be very, very challenging, uh, depending on your system. Like if, if you're talking about monolithic applications, relatively simple. If it uh, requires a lot of services, can be more tricky. Uh, yeah, especially if it's stateful service. It means for each pull request, you need to create own database um, and you know create completely isolated instance. You yeah, need some yeah, Kubernetes yeah. magicians uh, in your <laughs> company <laughs> to, to do this. But if if you have one, uh, it's uh, it, it it works really nice. It's, this is the point where your Docker Compose from the stage zero <laughs> will help you a lot, and still it can help you a lot if your uh, if your whole application can run still still can run on on one laptop. You can use your Docker Compose to run this application and test it. Uh, explore it and whatever, uh, make demos, uh, whatever. And yeah. uh, if you have uh, people who, who know how to deal with Kubernetes in cloud, they will uh, make you beautiful things. You just open pull request and uh, here you are. Here's your link to to, to environment made specially for, for this branch of code. Yeah, K Kubernetes magic is something, yeah, you probably will face. Uh, another challenge is uh, creating this test uh, database and here I have chance to a little bit talk about synthesize so what we are building uh, allows <laughs> okay. to create uh, yeah test databases very quick so we potentially can use it for uh, creating this dynamic environments like whenever you create pull request uh, you you can create test database for this environment very quickly and automatically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and to sum up this uh, second level which we just discussed with you folks. Uh, is we are braiding this end-to-end -end tests, uh, writing less them and moving them, them to low level, like unit and component level, uh, working more with environments and establishing the proper way how you can parallelize these tests and uh, as well working with some infrastructure. And here we are, like we do have, uh, we do really need some resources for that. And uh, as far as I see, we need some like, some engineers who just maintaining and working with all the stuff, not just you know partially developing some new features and working on tests as well. But we need some some um, dedicated some engineers, engineers, dedicated people. Yeah, and I, I believe like few people dedicated on this at this stage is kind of kind of makes sense to me. Uh, and 
to, to support it at least and uh, to create such uh, infrastructure and uh, yeah, yeah everything I think it's, uh, overall uh, topic of creating a platform team right so you at this point you have engineers not working on business feature but engineers helping other engineers like work on business features kind of um, yeah again this is like reality of scaling right as soon as you want to scale your system you you, you need to have uh, dedicated people looking after scaling yeah yeah that's true uh, yeah so we just discussed several levels like from zero to the second level I guess there could be the next level the third one where, where you can even improve more things and do some uh kind of maybe fuzzing contract testing and so on do do some google level stuff sort of uh i guess we will discuss it in the next episode uh with someone from from uh hopefully from yeah. google yeah hopefully yeah we'll see so stay tuned to to the to this episode and we will just talk about it next time uh so folks i think we uh, kind of discussed everything we want to do um Maybe you want to briefly, uh, yeah, we might want to briefly discuss the quality gate, what it is, because we just forgot to mention what we mean by, by, by quality gate, what it is. <laughs> so what do you think, uh, like, what, what's, the, what's the meaning of this word today? Okay, Dennis, you start. I will uh, give you my uh, <laughs> definition later. <laughs> yeah. Quality yet. Okay, so uh, the way how developers typically work, uh, they create a pull request with with, with uh, their code and somebody reviews that. But as part of this review process, you have automated checks uh, and uh, you typically want to make manual review as small as possible and uh, do all possible checks automatically. Uh, it includes all sort of things like running tests, running linters, running static analysis, running uh, security analysis and st stuff like that. And there are even uh, dedicated solutions that provide uh, this kind of checks uh, out of the box. So you um, kind of connect them and they uh, create this quality uh, gate for you. So they, they, they provide a set of tools that they run uh, automatically for, for each build. And, and this is a quality gate. Yeah, I think it's just a just a, uh, uh, just a thing that allows you to pass your code to the next stage. You just you checked everything you could check, and uh, now the green check you have green check. You can uh, push it to production. It doesn't mean that it will not bro uh, break at some point, but uh, still you did everything, and you cannot do anything more. And uh, I think I have another definition from the point of view of my kid when I'm working. He uh, comes mm -hmm. to me and he often asks me, uh, Dad, when, when the green check is going to appear? Because he knows when green check <laughs> appears, I'm going to play with him. <laughs> <laughs> A very nice one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah there, there is, I think, uh, more kind of management uh, beyond that. Uh, you have something called definition of done. So... Yeah. Quality gate is sort of formalized definition of your know, definition of done. Um, so if 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 uh, yeah all checks pass, it means uh, your increment is sufficient quality. It can be pushed to production. In some in some projects, we still have a manual code review and uh, discussion, even if all, all the CI tests are green. But uh, in when we are talking about most of uh, business projects, I think. Codes, yeah. code is green, then you can push. Yeah, the, there is also interesting topic of um, like AI kind of driven code review. So there are some projects which are trying to automate even that part uh, to some extent. Um, so they kind of review, really reviewing your div, um, but all of that is you know still quite experimental. But I think overall it's uh, it's quite nice idea that like maybe it's, it's, at some point in future you'll be just creating pull request and you'll get some magical uh, green checkbox and if it's green you just push it to production and, and that's all yeah I, yeah I, I i i would believe like that will appear at some point of time 
uh, but yeah, I, I don't think that it's just yeah, it comes in one year or so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but probably you've heard of this uh, copilot. We, we uh, still actually. have some work to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 and and this copilot maybe you you've heard of it and maybe you've tried already. But yeah, it's, it's, I, I'm still trying to write the code with it, and it feels to me uh, at some point of time I really want to just disable it since it's it's not it just distracts me from writing the code <laughs> rather than helping. But sometimes it's really help. So it still it still needs to be configured somehow, and the same thing I guess with the review will happen soon. So folks, uh, I really enjoyed the talk. I I hope our listeners enjoyed as well. Uh, as I said, we will have another episode where we discuss uh, next level how we want to improve, how we can improve the, our quality gates, how we can improve our test automation uh, with the, some guests from Google, I guess. And uh, yeah, to sum up, just discussed with you quality gates, some levels, how you can start from scratch building those uh, with even like small MVP product uh, with like, beginning with one engineer doing all the stuff ending up by some several engineers supporting this and several engineers working uh, separately with unit tests and features. Uh, here we are, Dennis, Ivan, uh, Seva, that's, that's it, I think, for today. <laughs> cool. Th thanks, everybody. Thank thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.